Accidents that happen follow the dot. Coincidence makes sense only with you. You don't have to speak, I feel emotional. Landscapes they pass on me. The little gets out, and you push me up to this state of emergency. How beautiful to be state of emergency. It's where I want to be. All oh, that no one sees, you see what's inside of me. Every nerve that hurts, you hear deep inside of me. Ooh, you don't have to speak, I feel emotional. Landscapes, they pass away. I confuse. A little get salt, and you push me up to this state of emergency. How beautiful to be state of emergency is where I want to be state of. chiếc cầu soi nước em đến thăm một lần bao lũ chiếm rừng họp đàn trên khắp bến xuân từng đôi chìm trong nắng diêu dích Cánh đào hẹp nắng tràn hoa, chim ca thương nhớ, chim ngâm xa thu hồn con ngày lớn chẳng buồn, diều nhau theo dốc núi nơi bên đồi thời đi chim đen lời áo im thời đây chân bước lòng ngập ngừng nuôi non như dáng thuyền sóng nước ta Ngoài bên Welcome everyone to Accented IRL. If y'all could show some love in the chat to our in-house DJ, DJ Puzzle for spinning the old school Viet, well, the Viet oldies for us. Um, today, on such an important day in our history, 
um, April 30th, 2021. Thank you so much, DJ Puzzle. And we'll be bringing back up um, DJ Puzzle when it's when it's time for the intermission. Welcome, everyone. My name is Philip Nguyen. I am um, the producer, producer for Accented Dialogues and Diaspora. And for those of y'all that are new, welcome to Accented IRL. Uh, the edition of Accent to Dialogues and Diaspora that we're doing with the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Um, just as some context for those of y'all that are new, for those of y'all that who this isn't your first show, welcome back. Accented really started as a response to the pandemic. We wanted to find and provide some sort of intimate space for Southeast Asian and Vietnamese culture producers to gather and have conversation on their work, their stories, their passions, their inspirations, and what they've been up to since shelter in place in the pandemic. So Accent to Dialogues and Diaspora is a project of the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, which believes that the stories, imaginaries, and poetics of a thriving Vietnamese diaspora can unite our global community. Today, we have a really incredible show with you, a beautiful lineup. And to tell you a little bit more about who we're going to be featuring on our show today, April 30th, 2021, as we reflect on 46 years of the fall of Saigon um, in, on April 30th, 1975, is our host, Viet Tan Nguyen, who is the author of The Sympathizer, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, The Refugees and Race and Resistance, Literature, Politics in Asian America. His most recent, one of his most recent books was Chicken of the Sea, done with his son Ellison. And his latest book is the highly anticipated sequel to The Sympathizer. If y'all could please show some love for our host, Viet Thanh Nguyen. <laughs> Thanks so much, DJ Puzzle. Puzzle. Thanks, Philip. That was Tang Lan's version of Bang Bang. It's both in French and Vietnamese. You can find it on YouTube. It's really a romantic version of that song that to me just encapsulates all the feelings that I have about being Vietnamese and especially being <laughs> Vietnamese uh, during, uh, during that time of war. And that's partly what we're talking about today. It's really just um, uh, such an honor to bring to you some of the guests that we have tonight around this day of April 30th. And of course, today is the 46th anniversary of April 30th. April 30th marked the end of the very long war in Vietnam, which dated from, depending on your point of view, 1963 with the arrival of Americans, or 1954 with the departure of the French, or 1945 with the, the public proclamation by Ho Chi Minh of uh, independence from France. So a very, you know, really tumultuous period, obviously, in Vietnamese history that has shaped so many of us and obviously led to the creation of a Vietnamese diaspora. And many of us have very deep feelings about April 30th and what it means. And we wanted to bring to you some writers and artists who have thought very much about this complicated history. And in several of the, several of the cases have lived or had lived through that history as eyewitnesses and as participants. So our first guest tonight is Lan Gao. She is a professor of law at Chapman University and also an author. She's the author of the novels Monkey Bridge and The Lotus and the Storm and a book of nonfiction with her daughter, Harlan Margaret Von Gao, Family in Six Tones, A Refugee Mother and American Daughter. Welcome, Lan. Chị Lan. <laughs> Can you tell us what that song was and why you picked yes, it? Yes, yeah. I think to tell you and share with you the song. So it's called Lei Da. And um, I, I know the version that's sung by Go Khan Li. And the reason why that song is so meaningful to me, it's extremely soulful. And you, you, you may recall, I don't know if you remember, but uh, there's a lot in Vietnamese songs and lyrics and uh, myths about stones and how uh, stones have feelings. Uh, it, there are a lot of songs about stones, how they match our feelings and we're part of nature and how they yearn and long just like the human soul. And the, and the lei da especially has meaning for me because it's about the, the tears of a stone. And there's a line which, uh, it's not in, in the part that was played, but it says, uh, it goes, 
which means at that time, I was like a, um, a bird that has lost its flock. And um, it reminds me a lot of April 30, yeah. because I felt very much like, uh, you know, because April 30 is not like a political or a historical event to me, even though, of course, it is a momentously historical event uh, for Vietnam and for the U.S. and for um, sort of the economic, the, the international system. But I, I relate to it as uh, like a stone that yearns and has, has feelings. Um, and, and the stone also, um, there's, there's a story in Vietnam, in Vietnamese myths about the, this woman who so misses her, her husband who's departed that waiting for him, she became a stone. Right, so um, in many ways, I felt like coming here and uh, having to start a new life, one part of me in terms of coping was to be like a stone mm. and to just sort of emotionlessly go forward with the eye on the prize. But because stones also have longing and yearnings and feelings and tears, that's the other part that's expressed in this song. And uh, the of losing your flock, and uh, basically searching for a new flock, is also a very very deep part of me. And I and and a lot of times I think of everything that is of significance in terms of is it before <laughs> April thirtieth or after April thirtieth? Because I am one point five generation, mm -hmm. and astonishingly, you know, even though I've been here for forty something years and only about 13 years in Vietnam, and maybe probably only um, nine of which have active uh, memory, I feel still very much uh, rooted in right. Vietnam. And, and everything that I have done since arriving in this country, uh, whether it be you know, in my scholarship or in my fiction, has been trying to make sense of Vietnam, the war, and its relationship, not just to the regional area of Indochina, but also just sort of the idea of emerging economies, um, how do you economically and politically develop uh, the, the, the issues of human rights, international human rights and democracy? Can the two be separated or are they basically intertwined? Uh, and especially women's rights as well. We can get to all of those things when we have all of our panelists here. But I really did want to say I love your explanation of the song. And I'd always wanted to write a story about the woman who turned a stone on the cliff waiting for her husband to, to come back. Never could, never could make it work out. Um, so really, thank you for picking that song. We had one comment from the audience, and I haven't seen this comment before, but uh, the commenter asks that we make sure we get the pronunciation of the names of our our guests right, which I think I've, I have done in the past, but Lan Gao, is that, am I saying it right? I, well, that... yes, but you know, my full name is Gao Thi Phuong Lan, and I'm, I, I am, um, I'm very, okay, I guess a little bit remorseful about dropping the Phuong, because when I was in high school, I, I was so teased by the name, nobody could pronounce it, I'm not sure why, um, most people stumbled over food and I thought, oh, let me just get rid of it. But now there are so many Lan Cao. But if I have, <laughs> I have kept food, it would have been, you know, a little bit more unique. Yeah, you but know, you, yeah, you, you the whole name because like for Viet Nguyen, for example, there are like murderers out there named Viet Nguyen. Viet Nguyen. So you need the middle name for sure. But anyway, you know, it's interesting that you that you brought up, you know, your entire Vietnamese name and the way that it should be said and arranged because I think I, even with one of our panelists today, I've discovered a name that I didn't know existed before. So that will be a part of our conversation, I think. Now our next guest, is Jung Van Mai Elliot, author of Sacred Willow, Four Generations in the Life of a Vietnamese Family. And she was also an advisor with Ken Burns in the production of his documentary, The Vietnam War. Uh, Jit Mai was featured in seven of the nine episodes. Welcome, Jit Mai. <laughs> Dương chiều âm u rét mướt trời về Wow, I, I love that song just from that little snippet of it. Welcome to Mai. Can you tell us the title of that of that song and why you picked it? Yeah, it's a song called uh, Chiều mưa biên giới. 
and it uh, is sung by the famous singer Ha Kang. And this song was written by composer Nguyen Van Dong in 1956, when he was part of a campaign against the um, Hua Hao religious sect. And uh, he was at the border between Vietnam and Cambodia, and it was raining and cold, and he felt very sad and homesick, and he thought of his family being left behind. So anyway, even though it was written in 1956, it became extremely popular in the, in the 60s, during the entire war, actually, because it evoked uh, the sadness of the war, the, the suffering and the sacrifices of the uh, combat soldiers who had to leave their family to go fight. And actually, Madame Yu banned it at one point because she thought it was demoralizing the soldiers. So I pick it because it, re it reminds me that April 30th, 1975, um, for all of its complexities and ambivalence and so on, it reminds me that it did put an end to the fighting and it did put an end to the shooting and the killing and the destruction and that uh, it ended, you know, the situation that made Chiu Mua Bien Zui such a popular song, um, something that just uh, spoke to so many Vietnamese who were tired of the war, mm. who were fatigued, sad, and long for a normal life. So I think that's why I chose it, just to remind us that war was very bad, and 75, they put an end to it. Although the consequences, the aftermath is something we can discuss because it did bring peace, but not peace uh, to a lot of people as well. Exactly. So that's something that we can talk later. We would definitely talk about it. Before we get to that, I wanted to ask you two about your about your name, Jung Van Mai Elliot. Did I pronounce that right? And is there a history behind the name that we need to know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Lan Kao and you, I guess you faced the same issue I did when I wrote the book. I thought if I use my Elliot, People say, well, it's written by an American. Why should I read it? Well, you know, what does she know about Vietnam? So I use, at first I used Zoom Van Mai, and then I thought, well, I'm not ashamed of my American name. So I used Zoom Van Mai Elliot. And I didn't reverse my name. I didn't say Mai Van Zoom because um, I thought, well, my name is Zoom Van Mai in Vietnamese. So I used Zoom Van Mai Elliot for that reason. I think we all face that issue because of our name, you know, how should we um, arrange it? You know, should we keep it the way it's written in Vietnamese or should we change it to the way the Americans use their names with the last, you know, our last name comes first, but in America, our last name comes last. So, you know, we all face that issue, I guess. Absolutely, me too. You know, like I, I obviously go by Viet Thanh Nguyen, and uh, I thought when I was be, when I was going to be published in Vietnam, the Vietnamese people would just start calling me Nguyen Thanh Viet. But in fact, yes. all my books yes. are Viet Thanh Nguyen without the accent yes. marks. Like I, 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 they see me as a complete American, and I guess I deserve that fate. All right, our next guest is Lily Hayslip. Now, Lily Hayslip is the author of two books, uh, memoirs about her life, uh, Child of When Heaven and Earth Change Places, and Child of War, Woman of Peace both of which the director, Oliver Stone, adapted into his movie, Heaven and Earth. Welcome, Jit Lei Lei. Thank you, Aim. Can you tell us what that song was and why you picked it? Um. <laughs> I like vọng cổ cải lương, and I also uh, like um, Hò Khoang from Central Vietnam. So I don't think people would interest in that thing. So I just thought a very little of it. But um, if I uh, have chance, I can sing you vọng cổ and Hò Khoang. Yes, you okay. have the chance to sing us a song, of course. Yes. <laughs> You want to do it now or you want to save it for later when we're all a little bit more tipsy? Yeah, we're going to save it. 
Okay, yes. great. No, because I grew up with that stuff. Not that stuff. I grew up with that music in in my house as well. Obviously, with with my parents, and I think so many of us did, of our generation. So that has particular meaning for all of us. The Vietnamese blues, I guess some people have called it. Thank you. Uh, oh yes, your name as well. I mean, I've been asking everybody about their names and uh, tell us a little bit about about your name and the history uh, of your name. Yes, my name is Phong Thi Lê Lý. But then when I came here, of course, just like all of us, we wrap off the our Vietnamese last name and adapt it to my marriage name. Uh, first is Lely Monroe, then there I came to Lely Islip. And so when I signed the book in Vietnamese, I put in Phung Lely Islip. But when I signed it just for American, then I just wrap the Phung and I just use Lely Islip. And so I think we are all Vietnamese have a common stress that somehow name it all messed up first, last, last, and first. But important thing that we know who we are, and the name is come with our face and our uh, identity and our black hair and yellow skin. So I am proud to just keep that way. Thank you, Jake Lady. Our fourth guest is. And here's the person who, whose name I learned something new about today, Marcelino Jung Luc. He's an illustrator, author, painter, uh, the author of two graphic novels, uh, Such a Lovely Little War and Saigon Calling, both based on the history of Vietnam in the years before 1975. He is coming to us from France. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him? Yes, and how many seas must the And Marcelino, welcome. Um, tell us about the song. Hi. Hello? No, can you hear me? You can hear me, okay. So, yes, can you tell us well, about the song that you picked? Yes, of course, you all know this Bob Dylan song, uh, Blowing in the Wind. Uh, this is the sort of music we would hear related to the Vietnam War when I lived in England after leaving Vietnam in 1963. And uh, then I moved to France in 72. And most of the music related to the Vietnam War was obviously uh, against the Vietnam War. And Bob Dylan was one of the uh, most famous artists um, rebelling against that war. Now, uh, this wasn't this this song doesn't exactly reflect re, uh, reflect my position at all. But it was this was very much in the air uh, in my youth and in 1975 too in uh, in, the, in, uh, in in Europe. And we were talking about names. And like I said, I learned something new about you today. I've always known you as Marcelino Jung, but now also look as well. So can you tell us about uh, about the name and, and why now, all of a sudden, at least to me, introducing the look as well? Well, because um, when I was born uh, in 1957, uh, my father being Vietnamese, uh, and we all had Vietnamese nationality. It was only our mother who was French, but in those days, remember, this was the uh, this was in the days of uh, Modinim, and uh, it was a form of nationalism uh, for the state, the, the state of Vietnam, the Republic of Vietnam, to um, to ex they expected you to have a Vietnamese first name. Um, so we all had both, both a Western first name and a Vietnamese first name. And, I, and my first name was uh, Luc, is Luc, because my, my parents, my father especially, uh, tried to, to pick Vietnamese names, which also had a meaning in French. And obviously, Luc in, in French is the, is the apostle, Luc. That's the meaning, that's the origin of my uh, Vietnamese first name. Thank you. Which I rarely use, but I was glad <laughs> to bring it out today. Great. I'm glad, so I'm glad too, to learn something new about you and, and about all of the history of our names and where we ended up and, and what that did to us in terms of the choices that we made. Before we get into April 30th, I want to bring out one final um, guest. That is our resident mixologist, Tui Fan. 
who has concocted something special for us just for April 30th. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. I'm Tui, or Toi. Um, and for tonight's cocktail, I made something called the Cyclist. Um, and it's a tea and citrus based cocktail that you can mix with um, gin or vodka, and it has jasmine tea, uh, honey, lemon, and you can use either navel orange or blood orange. Um, and you shake it up really well until it gets really frothy. And when you um, strain it into a cup, you'll see a, a layer of foam up top. So it's supposed to mimic beer. And the, kind, the concepts behind this drink was, I was thinking about tonight's event and talking about dialectic or dualities um, and looking at things from multiple perspectives, which we'll do with April 30th um, and remembering the date. So I thought, well, how can I translate this into a drink? So I wanted, I took my inspiration from Chada or iced tea and beer, which are both um, refreshing drinks in Vietnam and kind of combine them into one, kind of reconciling different ideas into one drink. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, the cyclist and just the name choice. Um, it comes from the word Radler, which is a German um, type of shandy. Um, and Radler in German means cyclist. So um, that's the inspiration behind the cocktail. I hope you enjoy it. And if you're looking for the recipe, you can find it on my Instagram at Mixaforia. Mixaforia on Instagram. And the, you know, you, she does the most beautiful, beautiful cocktails. I already drank part of mine, so it doesn't look quite as nice. <laughs> anymore but it's delicious okay. cheers thank you so much cheers. Thank you. Cheers. um so here we are talking about april 30th and we've already gotten kind of a start but i let, let's let's talk about april 30th and what it means to to each of you you have you have such you know different um historical and personal experiences although you come from roughly the same uh, generation uh, old enough to remember the history and uh the war and and uh, you know, events that many people in the audience were not there themselves to, to witness. And let's start with Marcelino. Um, I'm, I'm especially interested in your experience because you, know, you left Vietnam at an, at an earlier age in 1963, and then you ended up in France. You're the only non-American, non-American, non-US based person on the panel. And I'm wondering if you can tell us what, 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 what do you think about when you think about this day, April 30th? Well, uh, on April 30, 1975, I was 18 years old. I was doing my, I was doing my first year um, studying as a, as a student in Paris at a school called uh, Institut d'études politiques, uh, political science school. It's a pretty famous school in France. Uh, I was still Vietnamese at that time. I only became French the following year. and. The, the atmosphere in France was very particular because France was on its way, well, along, was going along its way to the, the left wing in France was hoping to attain uh, power and, and for, a, for a socialist president to be elected. This would only happen six years later in 1981. But in 1975, this uh, left-wing atmosphere was quite strong. Uh, many young people and many of, shall I say, to make things easy, uh, all the cool people, all the nice, friendly people would be left-wing. It wasn't very easy to be anything else. And uh, at that time in France, um, Many people were even Maoist. Uh, France's finest intellectuals like Jean-Paul Sartre were openly Maoist. And um, many people followed the, about the, the, the Vietnamese story. Many people were of the same opinion as the French Communist Party. That was the prevalent um, interpretation of the events in Vietnam. So I came, I, I had come from, from, uh, from England uh, in 1972, first in Brittany. And then when I had, when I got my baccalaureat, I moved on to Paris. And when I arrived in 1972, just 
try to imagine. This was only four years after May 68 in France, which was a big thing, as you know. And this left-wing, this leftist um, atmosphere was very uh, strong. And many people were um, against the, what they call the uh, American intervention. Now, there was very little uh, awareness of the fact that some Vietnamese might um, not share the view of the Vietnamese communists. They didn't exist. They were completely um, eclipsed by the overpowering um, American uh, presence. And for many French people, um, they were pro Hanoi or sympathetic to Hanoi, which was seen as the victim of the huge Goliath, you know, David struggling against the huge Goliath. And people kept, and still do actually, uh, often reminding us all the time that Saigon was pro-American and, well, for completely ignoring the fact or, or, uh, or deliberately um, conceding the fact that if Saigon was perhaps an ally of, of America, uh, well, Hanoi was very pro-Peking uh, and pro-Moscow. Uh, uh, but this was never said, and still is not very often said. So I, I just wanted to um, rush the picture for you of France in 1975. I think it's really important because obviously here in the United States, it's a deeply anti-communist country, and most of the people who uh, who've been here, who've come here, uh, came as a part, as a result of fleeing as refugees in 1975, and have brought anti-communist feelings with them, and that's dominated the public conversation here in the United States. But in France, I, I know it's a, it's obviously different, as you said, and that even in the Vietnamese community or the French of Vietnamese descent community in France, there is at least some left wing feeling. And there's, so there's more, there's more diversity of opinion, it seems to me, in France than, the, than you would find here in the United States among the Vietnamese Americans. Do you think that's fair? Uh, probably, yes. Paris was the capital in Europe where uh, both Vietnamese community uh, coexisted. And um, I suppose this was uh, an original um, aspect of, of France. Um, what I must insist on is that uh, this Maoist um, current in French politics, left-wing politics, was extremely strong when I arrived. Remember, Jean-Paul Sartre had created a newspaper called La Cause du Peuple, the, the cause of the people's cause. And this, this uh, paper was extremely left-wing, extremely Maoist, and he was the, well, the, the, the moral leader of the intellectual left. And the trouble was that they really believed that um, the um, People's Republic of China was 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 the perfect thing for Asia, and it only uh, they only be began to uh, to um, to um, sober up. It was almost like a, like a, a headiness, you know. A uh, they were they were enamored and drunk with with Mao. And they only began to sober up after 1975, when news started to filter out of Cambodia about the Khmer Rouge, and uh, and later and all simultaneously about the boat people in Vietnam. But it was, well, it was it was um, a very special atmosphere. I remember when I was at Lycée in Saint Malo in Brittany, because my mother was from, from Saint Malo, Saint Malo in Brittany. That's where I live now. Um, I, I just did my two, like my last two years of, of Lycée in Saint Malo. Uh, it was a big change for me from, from London. Now, in that school in Saint Malo, in that, that public, well, you know, the Lycée d'État, the public school, not a public school, but the state school, um, one of the teachers, there was a very nice French teacher 
and she was Maoist, and sh she really, and to please her, I would, when I returned to London, I'd go to this place in Soho, this, this Chinese uh, bookshop where they sold uh, Chinese propaganda posters, those very well done, very well made uh, Chinese propaganda posters, and I'd buy them, they would cost nothing, and I'd bring a few back to her, and when she would open them, the roll of posters, she would really be convinced that what was shown on those posters was, was the truth. And she was ecstatic about health, how healthy the children looked and how happy everyone looked. You know those smiles on Chinese propaganda posters? And I found that extremely worrying. This was a lady who had done three years of university studies and she was convinced that this propaganda was the truth. So I, well, I thought to myself, our, our, our position as, as, shall I say, non-communist Vietnamese uh, is going to be difficult here because there was, there was some, something wrong in their heads. They, they, they went too far in their, in their they were enamored with, with a, a, a utopia and something which had, had no link to reality. And this was the prevalent current in, in French leftist politics. At least at the end, Jean Paul Sartre came around and actually publicly advocated for the French to accept the refugees from Vietnam, despite their affiliations with what he might perceive to be a problematic uh, regime. But Ji Lei Li, you were, you were in Vietnam for much of this. You weren't there for April 30th itself, but you grew up during this time period of, of war, as you talked about in both of your, your memoirs very, very powerfully. Um, I assume that you were watching April 30th, the events at the, uh, with uh, the end of the war from the United States. What do you think about when, you, when this day comes around? You're muted. Very much nervous when you're talking about April 30th. Two part of me that uh, went through a very tough time in those days. I was 25 years old, mother of two, and carry my youngest son now is over 45. And um, I was here in San Diego. I sent my husband to Vietnam to get my sister. And now on 28th of April, he's still not bad, heard nothing from him. And I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, and I just like a nervous wreck and was crying and just thought that he dead. On the other side of me that I was so happy to see the war end, went through what I went through, saw what I saw, and the war end that it happy for Vietnamese, happy for American, happy for everybody. But when I get up uh, outside and talk to my neighbors, who is most of the navies, who the husband's still in Vietnam or already come back here, they say, no, we have to go and get the red commoners out. We cannot let red common take over the South. I mean, on and on. And I thought, wow, you know, it's just like a half of it, the war and that is what everybody wanted. But another half would say, no, the war cannot be end unless the South win the war. And here, my, where is my husband and my sister and everybody just like cut off completely. And that what, when April 30 come, I can be crying or I can be, you know, happy to see the war end. So that feeling is never left me. But when I live here by myself, never really go outside and watch the news, then I'm not really too much see or know what's going on. But if I happen to be outside where the community, Vietnamese community or little Saigon, it's just like April 30 all over again. It's just a very uh, mis emotional feeling. And it's very distressed to see how intense and how the up in the air with hatred and with um, upsetting and it's just, it just very misfeeling for me every time that April 30 come around. And even though that 46 years is a long time, but that feeling it never go away. Right. I think I think that's true. I mean, I think so many people who uh, who came from Vietnam who lived this time period or even people who are the children 
uh, people who live through this time period always report the intensity of their emotions. Have you been to any of the April 30th commemorations in the Vietnamese American community? Me? Yeah, you, you want to get killed? Kill? They kill no, me if I go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I don't dare to go there. I um, When my mother and sister came over here in 1973 when the movie premiered it, and I took them there for Tet celebration. And as soon as they found out that I was there, they checked us out so fast and they really harassed my mama. And she mm. almost fainted. And mm. it got very mean. I mean, when she saw the South Vietnamese red, I mean, flat and the uniform that, that they parade, she begged me, please take me out of here, take me out of there. But it's so crowded, I couldn't take her out. And then the mob over and attack her so hard badly. I just feel so horrible because, you know, here she's an old lady, she almost 80, and my two older sisters, they also, oh, but, oh my God, I just, I never forget those days. So every time the April 30 or Vietnamese test, I stay away the Vietnamese community because to me, I'm just like a tiger bring to the chart of the, um, the, the mage bring to the chart of the tiger. That is how they see me at out of Vietnamese here. Um, I, I don't know if everybody in, in the audience knows uh, the, the history of, of Jit Lee's work, you know, but uh, the first book, um, Ch What Heaven and Earth Changed Places, I, I believe was published in 1989. And then the Oliver Stone film came out a few years later in the early 90s. And so for a time, you know, Jit Lee was probably the most famous Vietnamese person in the United States, you know, with your, with your, the success of the memoirs and then the Oliver Stone movie. And it was not without controversy in the Vietnamese American community due to some of the stories that you you talked about in uh, in your memoir. So that 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 is what I think you're referring to. That there are some Vietnam, apparently a lot of Vietnamese Americans who hold who hold some of your stories against you. And I think that is one of the other connotations of April 30th, at least in the United States, that the some of the passions are so strong around this day that the nationalism and the anti-communism continues and any kind of deviation or suspected deviation from anti-communism becomes suspect and even even more than suspect can become attacked as in as in your case i think it's important to acknowledge that now jimai you uh, were also there during the years of the war and you were you know, actually, you you were part of the the Rand uh, Institute, Institute, I believe it's it was called, um, in you know doing research studies in the in 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 South Vietnam uh, around the war and, and around the uh, the National Liberation Front. So you had a very close view of what was going on, and then you came to the United States. I don't know if you were in the United States on April thirtieth or, or not, but what does what does April thirtieth mean to you? The collapse on TV, and I couldn't believe what was happening. It it happened so fast. But anyway, for me, um, April 30th, 1975, um, is the day when my family broke up. You know, we were very close. We, my, I was in the U.S. and a brother and a sister were in France, but the rest of the family. I come from a large family, so anyway, um, the sister was in Hanoi, but. The rest of the family was live in Saigon and they got together every week. And then suddenly April 30th, 1975, they fled. And after that, they chose to resettle, resettle in different countries. So some went to France, uh, one went to Canada, some stay in the US, went on to Australia and some in Vietnam didn't get out and couldn't get out for a long time. And some are still there. So to me, April 30th always reminds me of how my family broke up. And now I have to travel all over the world to see them. Um, so, you know, and at that time, it was extremely traumatic for them, of course, as it was for everybody uh, who fled at that time. And uh, the future was very uncertain and they didn't know what was going to happen to them. I didn't know what was going to happen to them. So April 30th always brings back the sense of uh, family breakup, um, the uncertainties of life. You know, in one couple of days, the ground was cut from underneath them and they were all dispersed and their life was turned upside down. 
and they had to rebuild and so on. So, and another thing that we uh, that I think of when I think of April 30th is the, you know, although Vietnam eventually after that became physically reunified at the years of division at the 17th Powell, but it also was a day of deep division as Lele was describing the um, South uh, the Amer Vietnamese Americans in Little Saigon. And um, that division still lasts to this day. And, um, you know, the, um, the winners in Vietnam call it the Day of Liberation, but the people of Little Saigon call it the Day of Ngai uh, Quoc Hạn, the Day of National Anger and Hatred. So um, it's a day of division, and it's still a day of division, I think. And um, well, um, yeah, I, I hope I think things are getting better. We'll, we'll get into that, but um, that's what I think of when I think of April thirtieth, nineteen seventy-five. Well, of course, the, the term that 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 many Vietnamese Americans have adopted for April thirtieth is to call it Black April uh, in English. Um, what do you think of that term? Black April. J yeah, Mai, yeah, Black April. I think. Yeah, I think that means it's the it's a day of, of darkness for them. You know, like not just for them, but for the country. You know, like a darkness fell over South Vietnam when the communists came in, and uh, it's um, it just describes how they think about that day. It still rankles with them. I think Viet, you wrote a book about how war uh, never ends and that it continues to be fought in people's memories. And I think April 30th, for a lot of Vietnamese Americans, is still being fought over. Um, is it um, liberation or is it national hatred and anger? And so I think it's, um, it's just a term that describe how they feel about it. It's a day of darkness that fall over South Vietnam. By the end of our conversation, we'll get to this issue of the possibility of reconciliation, if it's possible to bridge the differences between a day of liberation and a day of anger and sorrow and, and, uh, and loss, as the Vietnam, some in the Vietnamese diaspora would recall it. And Jilan, uh, you were there too, um, there. And, and you know, you, your, your own family history is also really interesting because your father um, was a very, you know, very famous general in the South Vietnamese army. So you had a very particular experience of going through this, uh, going through this war. So what does April 30th mean to you? Well, uh, it certainly means uh, a, a sense of loss for me uh, because we, we fled. I mean, it's not like we stayed and celebrated. So clearly uh, we fled. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a kind of ideologically driven view of April 30th or of the war. And I think part of it is because uh, everybody, I mean, everybody who is directly related to me, basically, in, in, uh, in my family, had some role to play in the war. Uh, as you already mentioned, my father was, um, uh, he was in the Airborne and uh, was a commander of the Airborne Brigade. Um, and that's what he identified with. Uh, he saw that as part of his uh, primary identity. And um, my, I have an uncle who was uh, a Viet Cong who was in the same cell as I think somebody, uh, or you know, another Southerner who later became uh, after the war, uh, somebody very high ranking, maybe even prime minister, I don't know. So I, I grew up with uh, my uncle uh, I call him Ban Nam, so father number five. And then I have another uncle who was um, a mine sweeper and uh, was blown up uh, sweeping mines uh, in the south, I think in the Mekong Delta. So they're, they're very kind of, you know, human stories. And um, even though my uncle was uh, in the National Liberation Front of the Viet Cong, you know, he, he stayed in touch with the family uh, and his son was raised by, because he didn't raise the son himself, he was in the jungle. So the rest of the family raised him, but he stayed in touch and he would uh, clandestinely 
come visit <laughs> in, in, in the family, uh, or family holidays and things like that. There was a lot of talk about the war and uh, what it meant and the divisions. So for me, you know, it, it's a, definitely a, a day of loss when we left. And uh, ironically, my uncle, my mom even, you know, kind of warned us that the, the day was coming, that his side was winning and uh, it would behoove us to leave uh, and not to stay behind. Um, I, I think maybe the divisions in the diaspora might be lessened. It's, I think, of course, we <clears throat> hold on to the past, but maybe it would not be expressed in the way it has been expressed if um, conditions in Vietnam had been different after 75, right? If, if there was a different construction of a post-war society, I think uh, the diaspora would still be very sad because um, we're not there anymore. But I think some of it is not just a, a holdover from the past, but also a um, kind of a sadness, very deep sadness over what has happened since, quote, peace officially came to Vietnam. I, 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 I mean, I, and we can talk about this later, but I've returned to Vietnam and many times teaching uh, the young generation. And I, I get a very strong sense talking with them, uh, the law students, um, about April 30th to them as well. Wow, that, what what do they say? I mean, because one thing that I, I often hear from younger uh, Vietnamese people in Vietnam is that they they have a very particular version of history that they get in school, obviously. And and I don't know what April thirtieth is taught as reunification day or liberation day and all that. So what do they what do they say when you tell them your version of April thirtieth? Well, you know, the reason why I'm allowed to go back to Vietnam and teach so often, I go to Hanoi um, National University and also uh, the equivalent university in the South, is because I teach a very seemingly non-ideological subject, right? I teach corporate law, I teach contract law, things that the government uh, approves of because it brings in uh, foreign investment. I teach trade law, and since Vietnam has um, ratified the WTO and become part of the WTO, they're very interested in this. So uh, all of my lectures attract students who basically want to make it in the market economy, in the capitalist economy. But what's very interesting is that um, all laws uh, of the kind that I'm introducing are about dispersed power. So even corporate law, you know, the American version of corporate law allows an individual shareholder to sue vertically up a director. Whereas the Vietnamese securities law only allows, let's say the securities, like the equivalent of the SEC to sue a company. So the idea that a mere individual, you know, in the peanut gallery can actually sue somebody higher up was, is very, very, actually very radical. And through that conversation, this is how we talk about um, 1975, right? Because I'm, I would not dare talk about like 1975 and April 30. But through that, you weave in the notion that individuals have rights, not just entities and not just institutions or not just state-owned enterprises. And they will talk with me after class. A lot of them stay after class. They all use the word yai fa because I think that's just like a, a that they use without really thinking about what it means. But I can say that since Formosa uh, has created all this pollution along the coast of Vietnam, uh, the sentiment of being very unhappy with what's going with what's going on with the government is much more expressed. Mm -hmm. I just listen to it. I don't even join in uh, because I've been warned, like you know, like don't participate, even though it may look like they're. Uh, all for human rights and, and, and whatnot, it, it could be a plant. But anyway, I discuss all of this with them, but all in terms of rule of law. Mm -hmm. And they, they are very interested. They're very idealistic, the young people, mm -hmm. and they are super duper interested in reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, and not because they're victors, you know, because there are recon people who want to re reconcile. Um, and it's easy to reconcile when you're the winner, but I don't get that from, you know, these are you know, 17, 18 year old, 19 year old students uh, who are very respectful and just yearning for knowledge and yearning for critical knowledge. 
not uh, memorizing, you know, not kind of like top down knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it has given me a tremendous sense of um, joy going back there and uh, interfacing with the young. I find it very funny, of course, that um, in a communist country like Vietnam, it's considered non-ideological to teach corporate law. Yes. I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense to me. State um, capitalism. <laughs> Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to, the, again, the re question of reconciliation probably in the, the Q&A with the audience. So audience out there, please send us your questions in the chat. After the break, we'll get to the audience questions, which I hope also will include these issues of what has changed? You know, what are the possibilities of reconciliation? What about new generations and their different relationships to April 30th and everything that it represents, both in Vietnam and also in the diaspora as well? But the last question I want to end with in this final round is this question of, of representation, because all of you are you know very interestingly became writers and, and artists um, and of course the stereotype uh, for for Vietnamese people in the United States I'm not sure if it's the same in France uh, is that we become doctors and lawyers and engineers because that's what we're supposed to do and yet here are all of you you all decided to write books or or create art and of course you all have dealt with this history that we've just been discussing and you're in France or in the United States and there is a dominant version of the history of, of Vietnam and the war and colonialism as done by the French or by the Americans. And here you are, Vietnamese people or people of Vietnamese descent, however you choose to characterize yourself, coming along with your stories focused on Vietnamese people. Do you think that we have been successful collectively as, as Vietnamese people in changing the way that the United States and France have chosen to represent this history. Let's start with you, uh, Ji Lei Li. What do you think? I think that it's the perfect way to share this little world. Because without April 1975, we wouldn't be here to give the, the world our knowledge, our experience, good or bad or different. That is why I think the younger generation, it will be the best place to write, read, educate, it, and share. Because so many young people, just like you say, Viet, is so smart, like yourself. You think you have that same chance if you're still in Vietnam. Many of us here today, would we have the same chance today that we have if we stay in Vietnam or Vietnam, or South Vietnam win or something? We only looking for positive. We looking for something for the future, for the better. We cannot turn our back history. It is gone. It finished for 60, uh, 46 years. We cannot do anything about the past. But with younger generation, with your generation, your children generation, and my grandchildren generation, they're the one who will benefit, and we all benefit from what being here. It was a sad day. It was a very emotional day, everybody know that, but it healed, time is healing. And so I hope and pray that more and more Vietnamese overseas can able to express themselves more, uh, writing, painting, whatever they're gonna do to contribute the healing at the same time that to bring Vietnam where it need to be. Still a lot of need of help. There's still poor, there's still a lot of landmine, the age noise, all the problem that Vietnam has to deal with. That is what now American or the friend or another country can come and share. Have been done for last 35 years, but still a lot more to need to get done. So April 30 is bad. And yes, it positively so many young, talented, wealthy Vietnamese here. And that's what I see that it's a very honor to have it here. Thanks, Ji Lili. Uh, Ji Mai, what do you think? Have we been successful at all in, in shifting the way that our um, France and the United States have, have thought about this, uh, this history? I think that the um, condition right now are more conducive to uh, getting our voices heard. And, uh, you know, thanks to people like you, Viet, you, your prominence has helped a lot in raising the profile of Vietnamese Americans in, in the United States. And, um, but I think that we still have a long way to go because when uh, I have the feeling that when Americans think about the Vietnam War, they still think of it as an American war. 
They think about the American soldiers who went there. They think about the battles that the American soldiers fought. Um, that's why I was so um, thankful that when Ken Burns did his documentary on the Vietnam War, he included a lot of Vietnamese people in it, a lot of Vietnamese voices. But um, uh, when it comes to depicting the Vietnam War, Vietnamese most of the time still play a secondary role. Uh, the most recent movie that you uh, critique in the New York Times, Viet, um, that's Five Blood. You know, it's about Americans going back to Vietnam, but they're all reliving their own experiences. And Vietnam was just the background, and Vietnamese were just secondary characters. So I think that we've come a long, long way, thanks to all of you. Uh, but um, I think there's still a lot, uh, you know, for us to do in order to raise our profiles and uh, I mean the profiles of uh, Vietnamese Americans or French Vietnamese um, so that we can break through all the clutter and all the other voices that can drown us out just because the public is more interested in what America and Americans did in Vietnam than what South Vietnamese did or uh, what happened um, to the South Vietnamese civilians. Maybe they know something about that because of Milai. But how about the North Vietnamese? They, they, you know, they, they have this idea, but they don't really go below all these ideas to find out what it was really like or what the truth could have been. So I think that we, we've done a good job, but we still have a long way to go. That's my feeling. Yeah. Thank you, Jimai. G, uh, Jilan, what do you think? Have we been able to budge the American and French? Uh, yes, of course we've been able to budge, but I can tell you, when I think about how uh, Vietnam is viewed, is depicted, is portrayed, the thing that comes to mind immediately to me is the movie, which is very celebrated, and it irks me to death, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, in which just fortuitously, you know, they inserted Bruce Lee in there, created some straw man version of him and then have him be like, you know, totally demolished by uh, like a cocky Brad Pitt, right? And I'm thinking, why was that even done? How is that necessary to take like the practically the only Asian male iconic person that we have? that is recognizable around the world. Because not only are Asian women represented in a very problematic way, you know, I mean, like the dichotomy between the dragon lady or the one who is gonna sacrifice herself and throw herself onto a sword for a white guy, uh, and she's yearning for him when he departs. Um, so that's the, the, the Western portrayal of the female. And then the Western portrayal of the Asian male is like, you know, like the the white guy is the standard and the Asian guy is feminized and the black man is like threatening and overly masculine. And we have Bruce Lee is the only person, okay? And he had to be taken down in this movie. And it's just emblematic to me of why gratuitously you have to do that. And that is how Vietnam is done you know, when it's portrayed by America, kind of like a side story, you're all stupid or you're just irrelevant, you're peripheral. We would have won the war if we had had better allies, you're corrupt. I mean, it just fits into so many pre-existing narratives. And it's, it's not just Vietnam. In fact, if you see any movies at all, even when the movie, uh, you know, let's say it's about some other country, the main character who is going to have an epiphany is going to be a white character and it's some background event in a nondescript country that triggers his consciousness. So in many ways, you know, Vietnam is a catalyst for whatever America wants. It could be, you know, f to further a kind of Rambo view of American power or a more conciliatory view of, you know, a more, you know, uh, dovish, not hawkish America, but it's all the same. And when I saw that movie um, and how they created that tear down of Bruce Lee, it's just, it's, it is the American 
uh, view of Vietnam. You, you can put Bruce Lee in there. And it's just like, okay, you thought you were so great. Brad Pitt, who's not even like a real martial artist, I can, you know, kick the heck out of you. Just. I, I would respond, except I haven't watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood precisely because of what you have just described, uh, G. Lion, but I guess I'm going to have to if I want to be able to, to pitch in here. Let's let's end with uh, Anne Marcelino, you know, coming from France, and we've heard three Vietnamese American perspectives, and I think the whole world knows how the United States has talked about the war in Vietnam because of American global power with Hollywood and all the American movies that we export. But France has its own version of this history. You know, I remember watching movies like The Lover and, uh, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, Landuchine, and Andochine with Catherine Deneuve way back in the early 90s. And it seemed to present a certain kind of romanticized version of the French history in Vietnam. And that still seems to be kind of, kind of dominant because when I was in France, my perception was that the French don't really spend that much time thinking about, about so-called Indochina. Uh, and, and if they do, it's, it's with this romanticized version and they get to blame the Americans for doing the really, really evil things in, in Vietnam. Is that right? And, and uh, you know, how are, how are the, the French and Vietnamese descent, are the French and Vietnamese descent at all concerned about that? And are they, are they like you trying to, to tell a different version of that history? Um, I'm glad you mentioned, you use the word romanticized because as I was saying earlier on, when I arrived in France, I, I felt they had a very romanticized uh, vision of, uh, of uh, the communist side. Uh, they had a very uh, demonized vision of the South and a very romanticized vision of the North or, or the National Liberation Front. Uh, to go back to what you were saying, um, those films you mentioned, Andochine and Lamont, indeed present a very romanticized vision of um, the colonial period. Uh, there's, there's a sort of reluctance in France, still going on today, to talk about the colonial period, because there's a sort of uh, feeling of um, embarrassment or guilt sometimes concerning that era um, some I often think it's it's, uh, it's it's not a good thing and it should be films should be made uh, more films more books about that colonial period uh, and perhaps we could hope to move away from uh, the binary, binary uh, vision um, that was very prevalent during the war years. Um, the subject of, of uh, Indochina or Vietnam wars, uh, the Indochina or Vietnam wars is usually, um, is usually occupied by the extreme left or the extreme right in France. It's a sort of battle, intellectual battleground be between those both both those extremes. Uh, the there's there aren't many people in the middle ground. I often say that if when you study this these subjects in France, you always hit the extreme right or the extreme left sooner or later. You'll soon get there, and I find that uh, a great pity because um, none of these sides um, possess uh, the whole story. Um, as Lan was saying, uh, in our families, in our Vietnamese families, we often have people, very close relatives, who were on the other side. And I find that a great, a great source of uh, understanding. Um, my understanding of the Vietnam War, I think, evolved greatly when I went back to Vietnam for the first time in 1991. And who greeted me at the airport? It was a close cousin of my father's called uh, Li Tian Trung, who was a Vietnamese intellectual in the South and who uh, in 1975 uh, came out as a supporter, a clandestine supporter of the National Liberation Front. Yeah. Now, it was very interesting for me to have long chats with him I spent hours with him. He spoke extremely fluent French. 
and was a very uh, cultured and, and, and learned man, very pleasant guy. And, I, um, for, and so was my father, who, who, who held the, the, the opposed views, although very opposed, but very enlightened too. Not at all a, a um, comment on dit, an anti-communist primaire, a, a, a basic anti-communist. No, not at all. Um, so both those sides existed in our family. And knowing what the other side believed was interesting for me. And I think this, this is something we can add to the debate because we're neither extreme left or extreme right. We have both in our families. And our generation can maybe reconcile those two points of view because we know the people behind those ideologies. I find that that generation was very um, valiant and um, idealistic too. Um, I liked them all. They were all good people. They, they chose, they, they did what they thought was best after much hesitation, I'm sure. And um, knowing that these were kind and humane people and, and courageous and hardworking. Um, and they maintained a link, as Lan said, during, during the war. They, 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 would, they would meet in secret around Tet usually. Uh, because the, usually their mothers would say, listen, leave your political views aside and let's get together and forget about all that. And they, they, they achieved that. They mean, and we still do. We, we, we communicate um, in spite of the um, political differences. So I think that our voices, it's about time our voices was heard, were heard more because I, I'm very annoyed often in France when I am lectured about my own history, either by right-wing French people or left-wing French people. They're very good at that. And I find it extremely annoying to be lectured. Uh, when I was born in this, even though I didn't spend many years in Vietnam, this was, a day, this was the backdrop of all my youth. My father was very concerned by these things and we would follow the news and after 75 uh, my grandparents and half of the family were still living in in vietnam we would send parcels anyway i don't like being lectured about that subject and i think it's about time we 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 uh, spoke out in france the vietnamese have this reputation i think they deserve of being a discreet community hard working very loyal uh, you won't find them uh, protesting much, uh, which is which is I find very uh, a good thing. But um, perhaps this discretion is 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 is, um, is to, uh, sometimes it would be time to to speak out a bit more. We need some That's angry French people of Vietnamese descent. I think is partly what I'm what I'm hearing and. Uh, well, Marcelino, I, my, my novel, The Committed, is partly about what you just talked about, being lectured to by French people about Vietnamese history and politics. So we'll see what the French think when it comes out in French translation. Thank you all for your insights, your contributions, your feelings and sharing. I think the audience has been really moved when I look at the comments here that what people are saying. Um, we're going to take a break. Philip is going to tell us what's going to happen. Right. Thank you so much, Viet, and thank you um, so much to all of our guests for today for our conversation so far. We still have a little bit left. We've got a book spotlight with the Die Critics editor. We've got some shout outs for East Wind Books of Berkeley. And we've got a couple of questions during the Q&A that we want to ask the panelists for today. Um, and we also want to ask Viet why he's, you know, why he won't use the word um, Black April in anything that he, he does, right? So um, definitely, definitely stay tuned. Um, we're going to be getting to the Q and A and the the latter half, the latter portion of this conversation is soon. Until then, I would I'm here to also remind y'all that, you know, as we're talking about how accessible this conversation is, right? Um, hopefully, y'all ask some questions in the chat that we'll bring up later. Um, we want to be able to use Accented and Accented IRL as a teaching tool, 
Um, so please, 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 this is your chance to engage with our guests. Until then, I'm going to queue up DJ Puzzle, who will be spinning some Via Old School jams until we come back. So DJ Puzzle. <laughs> Cho không gian tràn ngập âm thanh Cho tim em tràn ngập màu xanh Màu xanh Hãy đàn lên Cho sức sống vang lên lời ca Cho tự chế không bao giờ xa Đàn hay lên tin nói Xong rồi phải yêu đời Đàn hay nước sôi lên Tao có màu lâu Đàn hay giấc kinh với bao người đi xây Những công trình tương lai Thế quê đôi đẹp sâu Đàn hay giấc hết những giai vì yêu thương Quý cho rồi tiến thương Giữ quê đôi bà bình Hey, đàn lên, cho chim muôn về đầu cây xanh. Như tim em về đầu tình anh, tình anh. Hey, đàn lên, cho tiếng hát em bay thật xa. Cho tiếng nói yêu thương vượt qua mọi miền. Đàn hay lắm tiếng nói sao không phải yêu đời. Đàn hay nhung sôi lên bao 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 nhung. Đàn hay sắc tím với bao người đi xây những công trình tương lai để quê hương đẹp sâu. Đàn hay vượt hết những sai đường yêu thương với cho người biên cương xứ quê hương hòa bình. Hay đàn lên. ไอ้สมดำแซ่บแซ่บอยากเย็นไปจนยันคืนคอยที่ปั๊มปากซอยน้องๆใครสมดำนุ่มจะสิรูปล่อเล่นนุ่มสามล้อมาอุ้มกระ
Shout outs and thank you so much to DJ Puzzle, Accent is in-house DJ. Please show some love to DJ Puzzle in the chat. Cheers. Thank you, Puzzle, for spinning during our cocktail break. Um, next, I'm going to bring up um, the author of the forthcoming novel, um, which is being released later next week, actually, Eric Nguyen, who... Um, is also our Die Critics editor. He's the author of Things We Lost to the Water, and he's going to um, let us know what our Die Critics book spotlight um, for this show is. Eric? Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Wang. I am the editor in chief of Die Critics. We publish creative writing, stories, poetry, essays um, from the Vietnamese and Southeast Asian diaspora. I'm also the author of Things We Lost to the Water. You can see it there. There. Um, which comes out on Tuesday. My recommendation for this week is Mango and Peppercorns by Tung Nguyen, Catherine Manning, and Lin Nguyen. Mango and Peppercorns is the story of Tung Nguyen who leaves Vietnam during the fall of Saigon, entering the U.S. through Pennsylvania, where she becomes pregnant out of, pregnant out of a wedlock. She eventually leaves for Miami, where she is taken in by Catherine Manning. If, at first, the two women butt heads, but once Catherine tastes Tung's food, the two open He Rom, a Vietnamese restaurant. Mango and Peppercorns chronicles the rise of their business. Throughout the book, we learn of how Tung comes to her recipes, as well as how she, Catherine, as well as her daughter, Lynn, build a unique family. Full of recipes and stories of finding one's place in a new country, this hope-filled memoir is a great, is a great addition to the history of Vietnamese American memoirs and for fans of the Netflix shows, The Chef's Table. The book is Mango and Peppercorns. Thank you, thank you so much, Eric, for that spotlight and congratulations on your book coming out next Tuesday. Um, we'll Thanks. also have Eric on Accented IRL for our last iteration of Accented IRL in two weeks. Um, all right, y'all. So I'm one more shout out um, quickly to our bookstore partner, East One Books of Berkeley. Um, Eric's book spotlight for today, as well as all of the works of uh, the authors that y'all have had a chance to listen to today, will be on asiabookcenter.com, available from East One Books of Berkeley. East One Books of Berkeley, our bookstore partner, at a discounted rate because I know y'all love discounts, and especially on today, right when. Um, we're talking about April 30th. I also want to um, do a quick shout out for Eastwind B Books Berkeley and the Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies program at UC Berkeley. Next week on Friday at 7.30 p.m. PST, we'll be hosting a conversation on The Committed with Viet Tan Nguyen, as well as um, our guest Nguyen Fan Kuei Mai, who's here in the chat right now, Francois Jiao 
who is the narrator of Yit's book uh, on Audible and other audiobooks, and Kim Lee, who is one of the producers for his upcoming show, which maybe he'll talk about um, next week. So be sure to check that out. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring back our guests for tonight for the Q&A portion. So hopefully y'all have uh, some questions in the chat to make my job a little bit easier. Um, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Hopefully y'all are also enjoying the cocktails from um, Tui. Is Viet back? Um, one of the first questions that I have and I want to ask you all, I mean, I think... I, me as a second generation, my both my parents are refugees that came here um, to the United States uh, in the late 80s. I, I know this day as a day of mourning and sadness. And I know um, when I think about mourning and sadness, I think of this term diabong, right? But in the times that we diabong, we oftentimes have lessons learned, right? That one generation passes on to the next. And as we're reflecting on the past, I think I would want to think that, you know, all the people that are listening with us are passing on this knowledge that they're gaining onto the future. Jimmy Patel Nguyen asked the question, um, as a son of Vietnamese refugees and the father of two boys, I often worry that our Vietnamese identity will fade with every generation. My question to this group, what should future generations always remember about our Vietnamese heritage? Um, I will pitch this one first to Go Le Li, if you don't mind. Um, I think the best is to bring them back to Vietnam one in a while to make sure that they have connection with the ancestors and the um, the country. And the second lady did, of course, uh, teach them anything that you know uh, or share with them what their books, movie about the history and about the culture and about the tradition, and especially on a woman, how the Vietnamese woman can carry not only the work through the whole uh, of her life, but carry children over here, help to raise them, and hold everything to get it. I think that is what they need to know. Thank you. Thank you, Go Lily. And especially, I think Jimmy's question talks about being a son of Vietnamese refugees and as a father. And I think your, your pivot to Vietnamese um, women in the story and struggle of Vietnamese women is so poignant. I'll pass it on to... Um, Go Mai, if you wouldn't mind um, talking about what you think future generations should always remember about our Vietnamese heritage. You know, uh, going back, if possible, take them back to Vietnam or encourage them to go back if they can be there on their own. And uh, telling them about your own family history. And I think um, this is a project that I've been encouraging Vietnamese Americans to do, which is to, uh, talk about their, with their parents and record their stories, uh, learn more about the family background, um, not just when you arrive in the US, but way back there, you know. Um, and uh, I think that's all very important. And uh, maybe you can record your own memories or tell them your own memories of what you remember. And I think it's, uh, if they have this family record, I think that would anchor them to the, the country. I know that in Vietnam, for example, in my family, we kept a Zafa, a family history that is passed on from generation to generation so that we know about not only the family continuity, but about the summary history. Because when it talks about what the various people do, talk about their education, their career, um, their postings, uh, their achievements. It um, gives a background of, of the family. And I think that that's something that children can relate to. And um, I think that that's very important. And I hope everybody, you know, every Vietnamese overseas will do that. And that's something that I've talked a lot to Vietnamese Americans to encourage them to talk to their parents and learn more about them and their family. Sometimes parents don't want to talk about Vietnam. They don't want to talk about the past because it's so painful, but it's very, it's imperative that the children ask the parents to talk about these things. Right, thank you so much for that, Goh I, I just want to highlight this comment from Anastasia Lay, who, who mentions that her, her Vietnamese peers, peers in the Asian American Studies Department at Berkeley 
who are of the second and third generation are, are continuing to actively grapple with their shared history. And it might not just be this, this lack of interest in this history, but this, this um, gap in the, in the sort of dedicated spaces for them to create a sort of community, right? And for us, our community still runs strong. We still got um, 150, almost 150 people here on the stream. Um, what about you uh, and Marcelino? What, what is something that you'd wanna pass on about Vietnamese history and heritage to future generations? Well, I do this in, in, with my graphic novels and also with um, picture books for young readers I did in the past. Um, I, I, I do my best. With, I, I have three children, two, two girls and a boy. And I think that sometimes I th they think I overdo it a bit. And that um, you, you must understand that I'm half French. So it's uh, the Vietnamese side is, is more diluted and that um, my children don't necessarily feel the need to, um, to find great interest in, in Vietnamese uh, customs and history. Uh, I think I can't force feed them, uh, but they, they, they hear me enough and they sometimes joke about me going on and on about this. Uh, which I certainly do. Um, I do try to um, keep a trace of the, the enlarged family, uh, as, especially of its history, um, of its, which was passed on to be by, by my father, who got it from his, his mother, Banoi. Um, that I try to do. I'm not sure, for, for, for the moment, it doesn't really fascinate my children. Um, who are adults already, but maybe later, maybe later they will they will need to or feel the urge to learn more about this this part of the family. Um, we I, we of course I, I I have this fascination fascination for Vietnamese food too. I cook and this I pass on. This is a way of, of passing on uh, the culture. And I think that uh, in my upbringing, in, in spite of the fact that mother was French, I had a very Vietnamese upbringing because uh, my father was a, let's call him a modern traditionalist, but he really brought us up the way he thought well brought up Vietnamese children should be um, educated. Um, that was very strong. But well, I do my best, but sometimes um, it, it's not possible to, it's, the danger is to overdo it sometimes, for me anyway, in, in, in your, with my mixed children. I'll, I'll pass it over. Thank you so much for that, Marcelino. And, you know, I, I think it's, it is, I, I think it is, I, I feel that way too. Like growing up, if my parents inundated me with the knowledge that they wanted me to know, then it, it pushed me further away from them, right? And so it's, I think it's about finding that happy balance between um, what you mentioned earlier about lecturing, right? And teaching, right? Or learning. Um, Golang, uh, I know that you have a, a book that was recently re released with your daughter. I mean, could you talk a little bit about that in the way that you pass on your heritage and history to her and got her in involved and interested in um, what you do and talk about? Uh, that was more of a, you know, deliberate and concentrated effort where we're participating in a project together, which had its own up and down and a lot of turbulence. Uh, anytime you collaborate with somebody, um, you know, you have a different vision and it, it creates tension. But to collaborate on something that is so raw with your own daughter, who was, who is a teen, who was a teenager when you first started, the book is you can you can imagine quite incendiary, but for me really uh, because I have only one child and I, I do want to impart uh, the Vietnamese part uh, of her heritage to her. Um, what I've done I think is that I I do it uh, because I'm 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 all about the census. Uh, I'm much less about history or ideology or political positions. Um, although I do have it, but it's it's not dominant for me. So I, you know, I try to share with her things that are very everyday, 
you know, there's no lecture, there's no nothing to impart really. And I, I have found that she's much more willing to listen. So for example, you know, when I tell her about like smell, you know, I, I, I bring up Vietnam to smell with her, um, like Nuk Mam. And to share my history, I talked about how, you know, when I, when I went to high school, my parents wanted to pack Vietnamese food in a lunchbox for me and how that became a, a, a kind of bullying moment for me because it was very pungent. And um, so, you know, the, the, the idea of how, how smell can bring up a certain experience, right? I share that with her. So it becomes just a kind of like a normal uh, sharing of my childhood uh, with her. And I, I cite, you know, I remember, um, and, and this goes to a little bit about Viet's um, uh, feeling about Black April. I always thought that white is the color of mourning. And I, I, I told my daughter, for example, that, you know, when I was growing up, uh, we had mosquito nettings and there was always white. And my parents kept telling me, do, when you crawl into bed, do not let the white mosquito netting touch your head because they were superstitious. And they think if it touches your head, you'll be wearing like a headband a morning headband, and that's just going to trigger bad luck. Um, so, you know, I tell her about the color of morning in Vietnam, M-O-U-R-I-N-I-N-G, not M-O-R-N-I-N-G, and, and why it's white and how it's white. Um, hearing, you know, um, six tones in Vietnamese, uh, I've only been able to do five tones, and I remember when Viet was talking about how do we pronounce our names. Your last name is Nguyen. But it's a yoga, you know, and most Southerners can't even make the yoga. So we have a lot of fun playing with the six tones and what each of what each tone means. So when I try to impart the Vietnamese heritage to her, it's really through very tiny, tiny drops of details that evoke um, the five senses whenever it comes up. Like if it comes up, I bring it up and I incorporate any of my um, personal memory, either it would be about the war or something about Vietnamese food or, you know, the rain and the monsoon in Vietnam, you know, bring those kinds of things in so that it's kind of like imparting a mother tongue. You know, it's like your mother's milk. It's not information, it's not data, it's not knowledge. It's from the, from the inside coming out. So that's what I try to do. And I take her to Vietnam, um, and I think that's created a pretty good connective tissue with the past for her. And I want her to form her, her own opinion about what she thinks about the war. Um, and I just expose her to uh, all of the Rashomon-esque um, reality of the war and, and let her come up with it herself. Thank you so much for that, Golang. And I think, you know, I think about how Vietnamese is a, of the oral tradition and how a lot of what we pass on from run, one generation to the next happens linguistically or um, through the senses, like you mentioned, and also through these places. That, something that all of you have mentioned so far is, you know, that there should be this sort of return to Vietnam. For me, being born in the United States, like I know that the term "dive" refers to Vietnam, but I myself have not been there, right? So there is this disconnect between me and the culture and heritage there. Um, Via, I want to pitch to you this question. I mean, what? What do you want to pass on in terms of Vietnamese heritage and history to your next generation? Because I know that I think your your books are dedicated to Ellison and Simone, if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, I, I don't know if Ellison can can read the sympathizer just yet, but how and I know you're also teaching them Vietnamese as a you know, something that you've mentioned before in the accented series, but how are you passing on that heritage and history to them? Well, in fact, Ellison, the last time he came into my office, picked up the the committed off the shelf and started to read it. And I was like, oh, my God, don't read the wrong page with the four letter words. You know? <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, I, I endorse all the strategies that people are talking about here. They're all lovely. But, you know, my experience growing up Vietnamese was was both all of the noble things about our culture and our food and our language and all that other kind of stuff. But also, you know, Vietnamese culture is a bunch of other stuff, too. It's like, you know, I, I associate Vietnamese culture with drinking cognac and smoking and doing all kinds of terrible things and everything like that. 
And so when do we get to talk about that part of Vietnamese culture? When do we get to talk about the part that Vietnamese people love to gamble and fornicate and cheat and all, do all these kinds of things? That's Vietnamese culture. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, we don't also lionize and idealize Vietnamese culture at the same time. We're human beings and culture is what we make out of it. So bringing the, the, the children back to Vietnam, I think, is really important because then you get to see what Vietnamese culture really is. It's not some kind of static thing. It's evolves, it changes, and people do all kinds of things in Vietnam that are good and bad. Um, you know, my own my own experience was that when I took Ellison back to Vietnam for the first first and only time, I did something I never did before, which is that I I I was in Saigon. I, when I go to Saigon or any place in Vietnam, I go for the cheapest hotel I can find that has air conditioning, and I know how to find these hotels for like twenty dollars a night. But because I had him with me at one year old, that was his first birthday, I went to the what, the most expensive hotel in Saigon in in on Dong Khe, and, and we we got a room there just because I want him to like being in Vietnam because I hear a lot of horror stories about people who take their kids back and they go to the village, you know, and they're like there with the mosquitoes and everything. It's like maybe they don't ever want to go back to Vietnam after that. So anyway, we're, I'm doing my best, doing all the things that you mentioned. Uh, Ellison and Simone both like pho, which is fantastic. That's the gateway drug to being Vietnamese, for example. Um, but there is also some resistance. So with Ellison, he, he's taking Vietnamese online. I don't want him to do what I had to do, which is suffer through Vietnamese Catholic school, which is a form of fascism as far as I'm concerned. So we have a secular uh, Vietnamese language group of parents, and he also has online Vietnamese language tutoring. So things have changed so much. If you want your kids to learn Vietnamese, you can go online and get Vietnamese language tutors like we have. And then finally, he can't eat unless he speaks Vietnamese. Like unless he says some something in Vietnamese to me, he's not getting food and it's working. He is learning Vietnamese vocabulary that way. I, I think that's so interesting that you bring that up because I, I know that it would be a a cultural faux pas if I were to sit at, you know, like that, like a capital seafood or something, like somewhere where people have Vietnamese weddings and start eating first before um, welcoming everyone else to eat and using the word mai, right? I think that's a, a cultural tradition that I think gets passed on from one generation to the next just from um experiencing it experience that culture and i think that you you all bring up a really good point too and I'm, I'm bringing it back to marcelino's point about not romanticizing um the history and the heritage and and what it means to be vietnamese right and 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 so i'm i'm brought to i think a question about like thinking about vietnamese and diaspora and where we go now i know that y'all i mean um golang and and viet you you were in a uh a conversation with Columbia University this morning too, um, and Ji Lin Hang was talking about the afterlives of the war, right? What happens after April 30th, 1975, um, as well as, you know, in, 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 as we think about reconciliation, I think to also pull in a question that was posed, right, from, from Tedman, um, Tedman Jung is how do we work to enrich and improve the lives of our Vietnamese community members um, in diaspora and confront fascism and, and I would say by extension authoritarianism without resorting to xenophobia. Um, and then another question from Ant Jung who is kind of in the same vein is, you know, how do younger generations of Vietnamese Americans talk to their older parents and relatives who might be extremely right wing or share this sort of conservatism, right? Or staunchly anti-communist um, sentiment without necessarily severing family ties. And I wanna pitch this question first to Marcelino because you, you talked about, um, you know, progressivism and liberalism. And, and I think in turn, I think you would make, you might have a good insight into how we can have these multi-generational conversations about conservatism. Um, so if you wouldn't mind. Um, I know there's a big, there was a big debate re recently uh, in the States uh, during the, the, the latest presidential elections, which divided the Vietnamese community terribly. Um, I can understand why uh, the older generation in, in the Vietnamese generation in the States uh, can be uh, bitter and, uh, what's the word, um, suffering from, from nostalgia and, and be blissfully uh, wounded, you know, to them. I can understand that. Um, I also think that it's um, it's necessary to uh, be able to put aside one's opinions and to 
accept that the idea that the next generation won't necessarily share them. I see this all the time with my uh, children. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually beginning to feel quite, uh, quite a senior, you know, an old man now because um, society is uh, evolving around me and, um, and Sometimes I, I feel I have to, the, the time has come for me to stand back a bit and not, or try not to um, impose my views. Uh, I don't always manage to do that, but uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying not to be too, um, not to be an, an authoritarian with my views because every generation has its own. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it's a struggle. It's a struggle between Viet men mentioned uh, Catholic schools as being fascist. Maybe that's a bit extreme. I, 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 I didn't go to a Catholic school. I went to a state school. Uh, but the, my father was a, was a, was a, was a Catholic and, and, um, and a very, um, a very um, sincere Catholic. They're the worst because they they really the worst in the in the in the in the sense that they're, they're the more demanding, the most demanding. It's not only ritual, you know. You really have to behave like a Christian. So, uh, I, I I understand what you mean, but um, again. Uh, Whenever we talk about Vietnamese history, I'm always struck by the fact that uh, all too often uh, each side goes too far. You know, it's like that in many uh, countries. Um, going too far uh, to the right or to the left, uh, people get hurt. Um, I know it's really boring to be a centrist. And you, you, you look, you sound very stuffy and, and, and dull, but I can't help feeling a bit like a centrist because uh, here in France, they're quite hot headed in politics. I can't really feel concerned or I stay out of the fight because I've, I've had my, I think I've had my share of that. Uh, well, we, our history uh, shows us how bad things can get when, when when people get very extreme. So um, I find them very hot-headed sometimes here. And um, I'm trying to uh, be open to different opinions within my family circle. That's what I meant to say. I don't know if mm. I answered at all your question. It's for I think Right, right. Thank you so much. I mean, of course, um, we, with so much gratitude we have for you, Marcelino, you know, for um, in France time, it's almost, yeah, it's almost 4 a.m. Um, oh, no, and I think, right. I mean, what I'm taking a lot, a, a lot away in terms of insight into um, how we as the younger generation or the second and third generation can work towards um, this possible reconciliation, even though um, the, the ideolo ideologies might seem so polarizing, right? And I, and I want to pitch this question also to Viet um, because you are a, a fan of the polemics and a lot of your work is very polarizing in the community and your viewpoints. So if you could talk a little bit about um, well, both agency and authoritarianism um, in the politics of the Vietnamese American community, especially with, with today, April 30th. Well, you know, I think what people need to know about me is number one, I'm irreverent. So that gets me a lot of trouble. Uh, number two, I, I am allergic to all forms of authoritarianism and militarized nationalism and jingoistic patriotism. And I don't care where it's coming from, whether it's coming from the former president, whether it's coming from other Americans or whether it's coming from Vietnamese people. So I love Vietnamese people. I love the Southern Vietnamese refugees. I, I empathize deeply with the community. But honestly, when I see my fellow Southern Vietnamese refugees performing militarized nationalism, I can't tolerate it. And I will I will say so, and then people will get upset with me for being irreverent about something that they consider to be sacred. And as a writer, my own feeling 
is that my job is not to prop up the sacred, but my job is to criticize the sacred because nothing should be sacred. So anyway, that 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 take on things is not a popular take. Um, but I think that when we are talking about April 30th, and, and I think, you know, Jilan uh, brought it up with the idea of Black April versus White April, we, my, my take on it is that we both need to be respectful of the, the very deeply held sentiments and the genuine feelings and the, and the real political reasons why um, people in the diaspora, especially in the United States, feel this to be a sacred holiday or the holidays, take sacred day of remembrance. And we should be capable of also being critical when those, those sentiments go overboard, as we heard with uh, Jit Le Lee uh, as well. Thanks so much for that, Viet. And I, I think in a lot of ways, there's so much about Vietnamese culture and tradition that we feel sacred, so sacred that we don't want to cross. And I, I want to bring up this um, question from Hai Le about the Vietnamese language and honorifics. Um, and I think in the in the way that we use honorifics, there's a sort of kinship that is inferred from using anti and back go to, right? Um, and, and to talk about the wordplay and I think interchange, like how the way that you all refer to each other is different from how I might, you know, refer to you all as go or do or anarchy, right? Um, and I, I, I'm not gonna pull exactly from that question, but I, I think that as we think, and I, you know, we're running, we're running kind of short on time, but as we think back to reconciliation and healing and what that means to our community and what steps we might be able to take, um, I wanna ask some, I mean, uh, both go Lely, maybe first. Um, if, if you could give some insight into, you know, what kind of steps might we be able to take towards healing and reconciliation um, between generations? Yeah. And that will kind of close this up. I had this moment to sing you this song. So I have to sing it now before the time run out, okay? So this is answer many, many questions about Vietnamese overseas. So this is the title, it's Long Tong, Long Tong. So this is go. Lang thang giữa chốn đập người Thương quê tôi thốc nên lời nhớ quê Dù đây đầy đủ mọi bề Hồn tôi vẫn thiếu tình quê lạ lùng Nói ra ai hiểu cho cùng Nhớ sao tiếng mũi ngồi mùng vó vé Nhớ từng cái tiếng bụi tre Gió đưa cột kẹt mà nghe âm lòng Nhớ khi hương rúa dèo trăm Nhớ khi hương lúa đồng đồng thơm thô Nhớ gà gai sáng ó ó Nhớ thằng trẻ hót hoặc mó thằng bơ Nhớ khi nồi đất quặn rơm Nhớ nhiều khúc mía lùi thơm phát thềm Nhớ nhiều nhập tiếng rũ em Nói sao cho hết nỗi niềm nhớ thương That is for me on April 30 For every Vietnamese Thank you, thank you so much Goli Lee you're um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't think anything more needs to be said. I feel like that's so, I mean, that brings me back home, right? And and what more could we want to feel than home uh, on, on today? Um, Gomai, I'll pass it to you if you could talk about healing and reconciliation from your point of view and what steps we might need to take. I think uh, Marcelino uh, uh, alluded to this, which is that you know, different generations feel different about things. And uh, I'm encouraged when you, I go back to Vietnam and I see a lot of young Vietnamese Americans going back there to live, to work, to do good, you know, help the, the needy, the poor. Um, you know, their parents fled in terror from South Vietnam and here they are going back, trying to rediscover their roots, trying to um, do whatever they can to help the country. And so uh, I'm encouraged. I think that uh, 
Uh, I understand that the older generations suffer a lot and uh, it's hard for them to reconcile. And, uh, but I think the younger generations are more open. And so I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I guess not all of them are open to reconciliation, but I think a lot of them are. And um, I think reconciliation is a two-way street. So I think that the, the uh, Langao talks about what happened after 75, which still embittered a lot of uh, Vietnamese American refugees. And I think that um, it's hard for the Vietnamese government right now to acknowledge what it did after the war that antagonized and hurt a lot of people. But uh, it seems to me that um, among the young, the younger generation, I think they too are open to look at, at the mistakes that were made. And so um, I'm encouraged because my book is being translated into Vietnamese and will be published in Vietnam. So in it, I mentioned a lot of mistakes and a lot of uh, the sufferings that were inflicted. And so um, that's why I'm encouraged from just seeing what I saw when I go back and the fact that a publisher in Vietnam wants to publish my book. So um, I'm encouraged. Thank you so much for that, Gomai. And I'm sure that you're encouraging a lot of folks in the second and third generation now who are still with us in the chat and watching this live stream to really be able to tell not only their stories, but to see where their story intertwines with those of the previous generation. So thank you so much. Um, Marcelino, would you be able to talk a little bit about your thoughts about on healing and reconciliation? To wrap us um, on it. Uh, reconciliation. Um, the, the, the fact that there are many people returning to Vietnam is a good thing. I, 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 agree, I agree with my um, because um, the younger generation isn't responsible for the past and should not be held back by the past. And I think that um, the, this, this, this uh, dialogue they established with Vietnam is helpful for the Vietnamese too. And hopefully um, it will help uh, to Vietnam to move to a more pluralistic political system, which I hope it will do one day, because um, uh, I cannot help thinking that uh, the one-party system is outdated. And um, I am personally hoping that Vietnam will move one day to the sort of thing we have with, with it's not perfect, our democracy by any means, but I think it's better than a one-party system, be it right-wing or left-wing. Um, and also about reconciliation, now I remember what I wanted to say. There's a lot of talk about this in France, about um, not so much about the, Viet the, the Indochina war, but about the war in Algeria, which has left much more bitterness than the Indochina war. Um, we are hearing a lot of talk about repentance, that the French should repent for all the, the evil things they did in Algeria during the war. And I believe that, of course, there should be repentance. But I think, uh, as Mai said, uh, reconciliation is a two-way street. And for me, uh, repentance should be on both sides and if one day the Vietnamese government moves away from its propaganda and the way it tells uh, Vietnamese history in a way I find very propagandistic uh, we will have made progress because um, we are always told about the crimes we committed but in a war, crimes are committed on both sides. I mean, no one um, comes out of war uh, unstained. It's a joke, it's a lie to say uh, that you are perfect and the other one is a fiend. So the day they, they give up that um, 
we call it long de bois. Uh, I don't know of any any really good translation for that that word long de bois. It means uh, sort of recited propaganda. One day, if they move away from that, we will have made progress. Um, because it, for me, it's um, it 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 it's uh, it, it's uh, to debate. It's a uh, it is an obstacle to dialogue, and um, and again, it has to be both ways. Um, reconciliation only comes from each side admitting his uh, his shortcomings and his faults. It can't happen only one way. And in France at the moment, I'm sometimes annoyed by uh, this talk about uh, colonialism. Our president in France declared before being elected, being elected that colonialism was a crime against humanity. I understand what he means, but I find it completely uh, anachronistic uh, and not very helpful to the debate. And much too extreme to, to be conducive to a constructive debate on colonialism. I mean, when that sort of thing falls into the ears of um, poorly uh, educated, I mean, educated uh, you know, studies, study-wise, uh, youths uh, who are um, coming from um, Algerian or, or other African or other backgrounds, I think that it only opens the wound uh, instead of healing it. And um, we should be doing the talk about colonialism because we've, we've, we've known what it is with its terribly oppressive sides. But also, I, I think that Vietnam gained something after all from its, hun uh, well, almost 100 years of French presence. Uh, one thing we have gained is that the, uh, the political leaders in Vietnam of the, the former generation, the uh, Ho Chi Minh, the Gia Za, the, the, the uh, Phan Van Dong, they were all from the uh, La Caste de Lettre, the, the, the letter, the, the uh, Mandarin class. They had all traveled to France, most of them at least. And I think they had gained from, many of them had had a, a bit of a French education. And why were they so different to uh, other communist leaders in Asia who vociferate? You won't hear Ho Chi Minh or Pham Van Dong during the war vociferating. These, are, these have, they, they know how to talk to Western progressives. You don't raise your voice. You can't. You speak. You speak calmly and and collectively. You you look wise and frail, and that is the best way to reach their hearts. Now I think this finesse uh, was increased by contact with uh, the the the, uh, the colonial dominator, and that in this domination, there was also a lot of enlightenment. Uh, a lot of research, historical research today, admits that uh, Vietnamese nationalists of both sides heard about freedom in French schools, where they taught about the French Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, enough uh, one-sidedness. I think that uh, reconciliation means that each side it recognizes his faults. It's exactly like in a marriage and a divorce, you have to recognize your part in the, uh, in the failure to, uh, to, uh, to get along together. Thank you so much for that and lending insight into this, um, to responsibility, where the onus of responsibility lies, to, to recognition and, and what it might mean for us to uh, experience reconciliation, especially, um, you know, and, and I think just speaking to the way that you, your art and our art, right, and being Vietnamese in and of itself, I think is is so political, right? Um, I'll pass it on to uh, Golang, if you could talk a little bit about 
um, reconciliation, but also remembrance, right? Yeah. Well, reconciliation has to be that you reach beyond yourself, right? You're not gonna, you're, 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 you can't be entrenched. And um, my, my uh, area of legal scholarship is, in, I'm an international lawyer. So like Viet, I'm just totally against any kind of tribalism and nationalism. And uh, international law, especially developed after, 19, uh, after World War II, is really designed to deal with and manage the um, excesses of nationalism and how to manage and contain it in ways that both protect uh, domestic uh, sovereignty and also create connections in an international system. And when, so that is part of reconciliation, you know, that framework of knowing that you are part of a system, an ecosystem that is not just your tribe, your clan, your family. Um, and I'm very hopeful, as I said, when I go and meet the younger generation in Vietnam, they're very outwardly oriented, maybe even more so than the Vietnamese in Little Saigon because they know what it is like to be totally insular and they're just always future oriented reaching out. And I like to also think about, uh, because there was a question about our language uh, and the ranking, you know, you and bath and J and N and AM and all of that. But what I like about it is that, yes, it is true that it is a ranking system, but it's based on age. So it's not, um, you know, we all get to a certain age, so it's not exclusive, right? Uh, and there is a there there is something nice about respecting your elders, but not in an ex exclusionary way. But what I like about the language is that um, it is so. It's all about connectivity because you can hardly speak to a person uh, without trying to imagine if you've never met them before. You know what would they be if they were part of your connective web, right? So you have to just say, okay, well that's an or that's am based on their age. You, if they're like higher ranking than you by age, but lower than your parent because you know they don't seem like they're going to be your father or your mother's older 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 sibling. I think that's very nice. That is part of reconciliation because when you think that it's not just I, as an individual or I as a country, isolated, um, existing in a kind of uh, microcosm. I think the fact that the language itself situates us communally should make us be more willing to reach out um that that should be in your soul to reach out and reconcile with the other connection that you have uh, so it's built into our language and i'm hoping that that sort of built in imprint in the vietnamese soul um can be tapped you know, not ideologically, you know, because it's very hard to change people's ideology. Uh, by a certain age, it's, it's hard to change. But reaching out in that human way, that's so expressive in the way the Vietnamese identity is, is, um, is formed and expressed should help us reach that sense of, you know, what is your point of view? Because you are a family. We are not, and you know, it's not like the English language where it's I and it's capitalized. Um, you know, I is the only pronoun capitalized. So it's a, we have a very different worldview than the, the uh, English, uh, the, than the American or the English Westerner. And so I think the idea of a nation, you know, I like international law very much and the, the combine that with our language, um, that's how I see the world. And that's how I, you can only make changes by your writing or making a personal connection with people. And when I make personal connections with people, that's the framework I use. Thank you so much for that, Golang. And the way that you reaffirmed community um, through your imagination of reconciliation and posit towards the future and how we can use language um, to reimagine and recreate what Vietnamese identity means, I think is really beautiful. And I wanna just pass it on um, to Viet to talk about remembrance, to talk about reconciliation, and to also wrap us up um, since we are over the two hour mark and it's incredible that you all are still here with us. So, um, and Viet, if you wouldn't mind. Well, it's been a fabulous conversation and I really, you know, I'm so appreciative of all of our guests coming to share 
their insights with us and for all of you for for being with us and listening to us. You know, one of the things I think about is that on this day of April 30th, you know, we are 46 years beyond the end of the war in Vietnam, which is a long time in one respect, but not a long time in another. I'm coming from from the United States and arguably this is a country that has not really fully reconciled itself with its own past when we talk about things like slavery and the Civil War and, and many other uh, atrocities in the in American history. We're still a country struggling over the meaning of these things and their impact upon our lives in the present. So I think when we look at Vietnam and everything has been through all the decades of, of war and, and colonialism, it's not a surprise that the feelings are still raw in many ways in both Vietnam and in the diaspora. For example, you cannot go de you cannot go to Little Saigon in Orange County and wave a red flag, and you cannot go to Vietnam and advocate for democracy. These are things that are not allowed. So we have a long way to go in terms of reconciliation in, in broad legal and, and political sense. And there's so many um, aspects of Vietnamese history and inequality that have been raised by the Civil War and its aftermath that we're still wrestling with. So I think when it comes to questions of equality and democracy and human rights and and all of these deeply uh, intractable issues, we have such a long way to go and we have to be realistic about that. On the other hand, so many of our panelists have shared their optimism and I think rightfully so about the ability of individual conversations, about the capacity of groups of people who are trying to make their own livings and, and trying to, to, to make relationships and establish partnerships underneath all of these big political and legal questions and the impact of art on this capacity to imagine reconciliation in a different future. For example, I'm thrilled that Jit Mai is going to have The Sacred Willow translated into Vietnamese. It's, a, it's an incredible book that I think everybody who is concerned about Vietnamese history should read, for example, and all the works of all the panelists should be translated into Vietnamese. But of course, that's that's been an obstacle for many overseas works to find that translation. But we're starting to see some of that translation taking place. So there are signs of optimism and those human contacts that people have been talking about, the ability to go back and open businesses and have romantic relationships and form business partnerships and for Vietnamese people to come to the United States, not as refugees, but as immigrants and as international students and here to forge a new kind of relationship with the Vietnamese Americans that are already here or the ones in France. I think these are all positive signs that we should take heart from. And this work that we do with Accented and Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network is certainly in one way our attempt to also do this work of reconciliation as well. So I want to thank all of our panelists, um, Lely Hayslip, uh, Lan Gao, uh, Yung Van Mai Elliott, and especially Marcelino Jung look, look, calling, coming in so, so early in the morning or late at night from, from France. It was really wonderful to see you all here. Join us, those of you in the audience, for our next event, May 14th, Writing in Diaspora with the art with the writers Vincent Lum and Kim Thuy, two Canadians of Vietnamese descent that have made a huge imprint on the Canadian literary scene and our very own Eric Nguyen, debut author. It's going to be a great show. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks to Philip for hosting us. And DJ Puzzle is going to lead us out. Khi lên 18 vào anh phải làm Ba mẹ thường nói hãy liệu cho sau Mẹ ba không nài em Mong con có đứng ông chồng Trong giới giàu xa Em nghe mẹ nói em suy nghĩ 